But not least abbiamo l'ultimo talk della giornata e questo talk è questa volta in inglese, e, ma siamo abbastanza freschi ancora per uh, ascoltarci un talk in inglese. Io Presento eh, lo speaker che è Horacio Gonzalez. Horacio è um, Developer Relation Leader, DevRel Leader in OVH, OVH Cloud, e in questo si occupa appunto di strategia DevRel e ehm, anche altre cose che riguardano partecipazione ad eventi di community e appunto migliorare un po' l'ecosistema di OVH e fare in modo che sia piacevole per chi fa il nostro mestiere, quindi lo sviluppatore e, e ha a che fare con, con i loro prodotti. E il titolo del talk però è, è Kubernetes Operator, Kubernetes Operator, come lo vogliate pronunciare, uh, Operating Cloud Native Services at Scale. Le domande le uh, potete continuare a scrivere, appunto le prendiamo dopo, nel frattempo ci godiamo il talk che io presento, Orazio. Prego! Hello everybody, I am really happy to be here at the Incontro DevOps Italia to do this talk. I would have loved to do it in, in person and to be there in Italy with you all, but this year it was impossible, so I am going to do it virtually, of course. So let me introduce myself and introduce the company I work for. My name is Horacio Gonzalez. As you can maybe hear, I am a Spaniard living in France, so my English accent combines the worst traits of both Spanish and French accents. Sorry about that. I hope you can understand me without problem and you can enjoy the talk despite this accent. I work as developer relations, developer evangelist, developer advocate at OVH Cloud. And I am also very involved at the technical communities in my corner of France. OVH Cloud, I hope you know us, but if you don't do it, we are one of the biggest hosting and cloud providers in the world. Okay, we are maybe smaller than our colleagues at the Silicon Valley, but we are the biggest European hosting and cloud provider. We are in the world top 10. We have data centers everywhere and customers all around the globe. And we have a portfolio of products that covers from classic web hosting to public cloud, private cloud, storage, network and security solutions, and all other. And all that at very affordable prices. You are going to have high-end performance, like here with uh, high-end Intel Xeon Silver and Gold uh, processors in our bare metal servers. You are going to have uh, higher products on our private cloud. You are going to have instances and storage on our public cloud, all of that at a very, very affordable price. So please, next time, you have some architecture to build, some application to deploy, some bare metal server to get before going to another provider, before going to see what the cloud uh, providers in from California do. Have a look at our site. I think you are going to like it. Ah, and we have uh, an office in Italy, so Please, I think you have, you will find my colleagues at the booth, at the virtual booth. Go there, say hi, and discuss with them. I am going to talk today about Kubernetes operators. Why? Why do you need that on kind of operators in Kubernetes? Well, let me explain. So, Everybody agrees Kubernetes is really nice in order to tame the complexity of microservices. Hey, before you have only one big application that did everything, and now you have some 20, 30 microservices in order to do the same thing. If you are a sysadmin, if you are a DevOps, 
it is going to generate a lot of complexity. A, you need to see that everything is working. A, a container is down. You need to get it up. And Kubernetes, Kubernetes arrives there and helps by orchestrating all that, by taking all the routinary tasks from the sysadmin, from the DevOps, and automatizing them, automizing them. Hey, that's really nice. So you can now deploy your microservices application in an easy way. You can monitor them in an easy way. And a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks are done, are done automatically by Kubernetes. That's nice. But, but what about complex, really complex deployment? Hey, you have not only one uh, microservices application to deploy, but our uh, information system with lots of servers, lots of applications, lots of microservices. Hey, you are going to generate lots of Kubernetes objects for all that, and you have a new level of complexity. You don't have the complexity for each individual application, but for the world system, you need to deal with all those ingresses, services, deployment spots, everything needs to be put at the new version. What about upgrades? What about uh, trying to do some um, blue-green testing? What about, hey, it's difficult to manage. Especially, especially if you aren't dealing only with one cluster, but with two, five, 50, 500, 5,000. If you have lots and lots of clusters with lots and lots of complex deployments inside them, you cannot, you cannot hope to manage those Kubernetes manually. We already know that. <laughs> So this talk, it is created for our, from our own experience because we manage a managed Kubernetes platform. So we offer to our customers a Kubernetes off the shelf. They don't need to install it. They don't need to manage it. They only need to use it to deploy their application and architectures on those managed Kubernetes. But that also means that we, as the provider, we need to manage all those thousands of customer clusters to upgrade them, to be sure that they work correctly and all that. So for us, the idea of going at the scale is especially important. We have built our own managed Kubernetes platform over our public cloud solution built on OpenStack. That means that uh, we already have had all the experience in order to manage uh, our public cloud, our OpenStack solution, we build our Kubernetes on it. So the basic part of the going at the scale at Kubernetes was done, but we needed to tame the complexity of, manage, of managing all those clusters, keeping them updated, upgraded, uh, secure, keeping the, the backup, all that kind of complex problem uh, needed to be tackled at the scale. One of the first tools that people use when they want to manage this complexity in Kubernetes is something like Helm, a package manager. It makes something simple. For example, for a, for a complex deployment with a lot of objects, you aren't going to keep every object in their own manifest. You are going to keep a global Helm chart where you describe all the ingress services, etc., etc. And you are going to be able to put parameters on it in order to create several copies of that. It's a good way to manage complexity when deploying, when making upgrades, when making rollbacks, when sharing. But it isn't the fully solution. Why? Because the day-to-day -day task of a sysadmin, of a DevOps, of a, of a SRE operator is way more complex. Helm only help in the first two step, installing and upgrading. And the human operator 
needs to do a lot of things, follow the life cycle of the application, uh, getting logs and metrics and trying to get and traces and trying to get some insight for it, automating things. Uh, uh, and for this kind of operations, Helm doesn't help at all. So if we wanted, as we did, to have some solution to make the day-to-day -day operation of those clusters uh, easier, we couldn't only use Helm. We needed to have some more complex solution or some more complete solution. Kubernetes is all about automation. It's about automating things. So the idea is, hey, maybe we could automate this operations part. Not only the first two steps, but, but the world five steps. And that's just the idea of a Kubernetes operator. Taking the knowledge um, of a human operator, the day-to-day -day operations they need to do on a Kubernetes cluster or on some part of the Kubernetes cluster, on some specific deployment for a Kubernetes cluster, and automate it, encode it, and allowing Kubernetes to take care of these routinary tasks. Like that, the human operator can center themselves in added value task and left and leave the routinary part, the low value, the low added value task to the system. That's the idea behind Kubernetes operators creating a Kubernetes version of the human operator for the war steps of the day-to-day -day task, installing, upgrading, lifecycle, inside an autopilot. How can this operator, how are these operators built? Well, they are built on Kubernetes concepts. They aren't something outside Kubernetes. They use basic Kubernetes building bricks. They use controllers and custom resources. Let me talk a bit about them. Kubernetes controllers. What are Kubernetes controllers? Well, Kubernetes controllers are reconciliation loop, control loops. The idea is they look at the current state of the clusters. They look at the desired state of the cluster the manifest, the YAML files, and they find the difference and they modify the current state to make it as close as possible to the desired state. They are a key part of the magic behind Kubernetes. So they observe, they make the difference, they find the difference and they act in order to be sure that the current state is every time as close as possible to the desired state. Each controller is specialized in some kind of resource, some kind of Kubernetes objects, some part of the Kubernetes cluster. So there are lots of different controllers in a Kubernetes cluster. Custom resource def definitions, CRD, are another key element of Kubernetes. They allow us to extend, extend Kubernetes by creating no rest, new resources. So you can define a new kind of resources that wasn't uh, existing in the original Kubernetes or in the open source Kubernetes, a custom resources, a custom resource for your own utilization. And operators take this two concepts and combine them in order to create the human, the, the Kubernetes version of the human operator. So we try to, in, when we create a Kubernetes operator, we try to encode the human knowledge, the task that the human operator do, we try to encode them as a, as controllers and custom resource definition in order to allow Kubernetes to do this kind of task in the place of the human operator. For example, it's going to be more concrete. We have some databases. Uh, if you ask the human operator 
what are their operations in a database? Well, we need uh, to add new instance to the pool. We need to do backups. We need to do some sharding with the data set are too big. These kind of things are needed. Without them, the databases won't work. And they are day to day uh, and they take a lot of time, but they aren't especially complicated. They are routinary day-to-day -day task. Good candidates in order to be used, uh, to be put in operators. So the idea is working with the human operator, trying to see what are the custom resource definitions and controllers needed in order to do these kind of things. For example, hey, about the backup. Well, when I do a backup, I need to stop uh, the writing of the database. They do it in a snapshot and putting the snapshot elsewhere. So maybe we will need an CRD to, to represent the whole database cluster, another CRD to represent each database instance, and the controller need to see if it is time to do a backup and then uh, stop instance by instance the writing and doing the snapshotting and then putting the snapshot elsewhere. So, and then for adding a new cluster, a new instance, well, we already have the CRD for the instance, the CRD for the cluster, so we can represent the database clusters and the database instance. So the controller need to see for all the current instance if they are too heavily loaded, and then it can create a new instance. So the idea is that using CRD to represent the concept and controllers to represent the actions, you are going to create a new operator. In this case, a database operator for a specific kind of database, a PostgreSQL operator, a Redis operator, or your super own database operator. Donc, basically, that's the idea behind operators, combining custom resources and operators, uh, custom resources and controllers in order to automate. And all operators are in the same. You can do some very basic operators. You can do really complex, smart one. So the community in general has divided the operators in five categories that are similar or map it on the five kind of tasks the human operator had to do, from basic install to upgrades to the full life cycle of the of the solution, adding new instance, uh, things like that, uh, doing the backups and all that, to the inside part that means having a good traces, logs, and metric solution and trying to get some insight not to be not only reactive, not only change, adding new disk when the disk is full, but when you say that the trend is that the disk is going to be full soon. So having this kind of a uh, prevision, you could say, and then the last one, the five uh, step operator, the phase five operators uh, doing some really autopilot. For example, detecting that the database cluster is almost full uh, and adding new instance by itself or doing the sharding by itself, all without having to tell the human operator, hey, hey, people, you need to do something. No, automating all the maintenance uh, tasks. So, this five phase of operators uh, can allow you to choose uh, to what point you are going to automate the task. How can you do it? Because, hey, okay, it seems nice. It seems you could, you could have need uh, of a new operator. How can you do it? Well, it is relatively easy. You create a new project. You define the CRD you are going to need. So what are the concepts you are going to map into your operator? For our database example, we needed to map the database clusters, the instance, the, the disk part, and some other things, okay? And then you are going to define 
how you are going to watch this resource and what are the action. For example, in our database for the backup part, the controller would need to verify that the schedule uh, backup is done or not. And if it is the scheduled time and you need to do the backup, it should need to verify that it can change the configuration of its instance to put it, to put it in to forbid the right and then doing the snapshot and then putting the snapshot in another uh, storage. And then you build the operator with this CRD and these controllers. There are some tools to make it easier. One of them is Cube Builder. It is an is the key to build Kubernetes APIs. Another is the operator framework that is more than the precedent because there is an SDK, but also there is a world lifecycle manager and some metering tools in order to see if your operator is working as intended. And the operator SDK allows you to build a test iterate to do the whole life cycle of the operators in three different paradigms, three different languages using Helm, using Ansible or using Go language. It depends on what kind of operator you are trying to build and what is the experience of your developer team. If you are using Helm, you are only going to be able to build sample operators, phase one and two. But if you are using both Ansible and Golang, you are going to be able to create full mature level five operators. The lifecycle manager allows to manage the different operators in your cluster to be sure that there is no difference, uh, no incompatibility between them to do upgrades and rollback of operator and all that. There are lots and lots of open source operators in Operator Hub. Uh, you can get an eye at get an eye at it. And I am going to talk in the five last minutes about a harbor operator. It's one operator we have done for our own needs and we have released in open source. And it's a good example of why operators are important for us. So we wanted to build a new product because our customers asked us for it. Obvious Cloud Managed Private Registry, a private registry to put the Docker image and the Helm chart for our customers. We wanted to build it based on open source because if in, it is in our culture and there were two competing products at the time, Harbor and Portus, both built on Docker registry. And Harbor had lots and lots of traction. So we decided to build it on it. It was a good move because since then, Harbor has become, had become the cloud native uh, computing foundation official option for Kubernetes registry. Harbor is complex. It has a lot of different elements for the Docker registry itself to notary, to see vulnerabilities, our museum, several database, Helm, lot a lot of things. It has an Helm chart, but for us, it wasn't enough because we need to operate thousands of registry and we don't only want to to install it in a simple way. We need to tune it. We need to manage manage it. So we wanted a managed private registry, a bit special. We wanted to build it in a economic way for our customers. We wanted to reuse our services and we wanted to be sure that every customer had shared resources for the non-private part, but full privacy for the registry part. We wanted to use the platform as much as possible to do things as close as possible to Vanilla Kubernetes. So we wanted to use the Kubernetes tooling at max, but we wanted to automate it. And in order to automate all those deployments, we needed to do, a, we needed an operator. And there was no operator in the community for Harbor. We talk a lot with the community and we saw that the need, the need, it wasn't alone for us. Lots and lots of people in the community had a similar, not maybe not at the same scale, but a similar need. So we decided to build the operator, but not build a custom specific version for, uh, for ourselves, build a version that could be released as open source, a given 
at giving back to the community because it is our culture too. So we, we begin to build it and the challenge was that the controllers were complex. There are many elements, many possible ex states, many different kind of errors and many different levels that need to be deal with and many external dependencies. We try to do it in a modular way. We wrote it in Go because we had developers that were experienced in Go. We try to re reuse as many things as possible from the standard Kubernetes and create uh, as few things as possible. We use Cube Builder and we try to re reuse as many um, standard Kubernetes operators as possible, for example. Uh, at the moment, we needed to deal with, deal with certificates. We didn't want to add all the intelligence to deal, in, to deal with certificates in our operator. We used it for that. The search manager operator that already exists is widely used and it makes things sample. So we wanted to be an operator for one task, managing harbor, and reuse uh, other elements inside our operator for all the external tasks. We did it. It is open source now. It can be done at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It is part of the official Harbor project now. So for us, building this operator allow, allowed us to create a new product and to be able to propose it to, the, to our customers and be able to do all the system operation of it in a quick and relative painless way. Let's look at another example, our load balancer operator. It's a good example, not open source yet, but it, it shows how you can create a whole new kind of things using Kubernetes with the help of operators. A load balancer is a critical cog for a cloud provider or a hosting provider like us. It allows us to get traffic from an external IP address and redirect them uh, this traffic to the internal servers who are going to answer the requests. Mm, without a load balancing, a cloud provider cannot work. We had a very robust uh, legacy load balancer stack. It is very performant. It is built in custom-made bare metal servers and BGP. Uh, these servers are especially tuned for traffic. It makes the world uh, less termination using uh, the world SSL. It's interface with Let's Encrypt for the certificate, but it isn't cloud ready. What I mean by that? I mean that our legacy load balancing stack is piloted by configuration files that take a long time to load. So you cannot update it on the fly for every individual customer where they want to think to change something. And it is made on custom built hardware. We at OBS Cloud, we build our own servers from the component. Uh, we master all the building chain. So we get the components like the super Xeon processors from Intel I talked uh, before. And um, we take all the different components, the motherboard, we install everything. We put them in custom made um, racks and we put them in the data centers. But in order to do it in an efficient way, we try to uh, standardize our offers. So we can have several runs of servers according to the performance. Keeping an special run internal only for the load balancing, it's complicated, especially when you must deliver these servers at 30 different data centers around the world. It will be better if we could use any of our mm, high-grade servers or normal servers from our range and put them in our load balancing stack. So. It was included, it just said specialized hard, we needed to change that. And we needed to create a new load balancing stack, supporting mass upda uh, updates, being easy and quick to reconfigure, using any available hardware and being very easy to operate. And really we needed a public cloud ready load balancer. 
we decided to build it in Kubernetes because it was uh, the best solution for us. Why? Well, we wanted to base it in a Azure proxy, an open source solution, uh, a reverse proxy open source solution that works really well. And the idea was for every load balancer, and we have mm, uh, thousands, millions in the new solution, we hope to have millions, we needed to have a pod for load balancer. And in this pod, we want to run an, a small Asha proxy and three network interface from the internet, from the intranet, and for configuration, and adding some metrics and logs. So if we build this kind of pod and we put it in our Kubernetes solution, we will be able to automatically deploy or, and modify all those load balancers. But we are talking about millions, so we cannot do it by hand. It is simply impossible. We needed an operator. The first step in building this operator was to be able to put the three network interface wholly different in a pod. In order to do that, we use a multus C and I, C and E, sorry, C and E. A multus C and E allows to, to put different network interfaces in one pod and configure them, some in breed, some in localhost, and all that. So with uh, Multus, we will be able, we were able to define each one of our pods with its three network interfaces. And how can we do the config management? I mean, in every pod, it is going to have an Asha proxy. This Asha proxy use a config file. How we are we going to change its configuration? For that, we wanted to use config map. The idea is we modify the config map of the pod and Asha proxy is going to reread that in order to apply this configuration. And as individual Asha proxy only manage one customer, rereading the conf is almost instantaneous. So it solved our problem of being cloud ready. And for that, we needed to trigger this rereading. So from the outside, we can change the config, but but how can we notify the Asha proxy that it needs to read the config again? Well, using a controller, it looks at the current Asha proxy configuration and the configuration in the config map. And when there is a difference, that's what a controller does, it says the Asha proxy, hey, the config has changed. Can you please reread it? And using that, we are able to keep the configuration and the Asha proxy synchronized. What about taking metrics of that? Well, we try to use a Prometheus operator, but Prometheus operator didn't work at the time with, with more than one container per pod. We already had several of them with the controller, with the Asha proxy and all that. So we needed another solution. Internally, we use a work 10 stack for the observability. So we decided to use Vimeon, an open source solution to put the metrics into work 10 uh, by using another operator, the Vimeon operator, that take the metrics from the Asha proxy and push them to the outside, in this case, to our uh, work 10 based observability solution. And for me, I think I am a bit late. That's all. If you will have some questions, uh, I am here in order to try to answer them. Please feel free to ask. Thank you very, very much. Hey, Dara, we are in Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so people look at Ratio because uh, he he was struggling finding out uh, out a place with good Wi-Fi, isn't it? Because he's not in holiday. He's he's uh, I don't know in a beautiful I place. Uh, as per, but you are I working, working, so <laughs> so it was working. Uh, I am at the working, side. but I'm in a in a beautiful place at the <laughs> south of France in order to have some quality Wi-Fi in order to be able to do 
this question and answer. Sorry about that. I tried to connect before, but my connection was really wasn't reliable enough. So uh, now it's it's good I have indeed. migrated here. So um, it's perfectly clear and fine. Audio is in sync, so don't worry. Wow. Okay, so that, that's the reason. We, we still move uh, as people close to where the cloud is, I guess. The hardware is somewhere. So, I mean, after the cloud, there is still some hardware, isn't it? <laughs> people, something don't realize it, uh, forgot it, because it's just the cloud, but it, it's not so so easy, indeed. Great talk. I love the, this uh, uh, complexity uh, because it's not so common having a look uh, inside uh, this kind uh, of uh, complexity. I mean, uh, OVH uh, is a, um, it's, it's a company that has a purpose. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, OVH Cloud, sorry, uh, because uh, I, I saw you that. The, the Don't worry, language, uh, many OVH people Cloud. still use, use the old name. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but OVH Cloud is still, a, I guess, a place where there is mm, quite a lot of challenges that uh, other kind of business are are not going to have uh, or because of the nature of the the, the, the the stock level you are operating at. So you cited GPUs. Yeah, uh, there are often. Metal. Yeah, there are often challenges of going to a scale. Many products that work rather well in normal scale have some uh, unforeseen problems when you go at a higher scale having hundreds or thousands of instances or whatever. And a lot of data centers too. That is not, uh, not yeah. something that we should... And <laughs> that means that everything is distributed at a big scale too, yeah. Okay, no, because uh, a lot of companies still have uh, bare metal or data center hardware, but uh, managing it as a private cloud and with the, this kind of maturity, it's, 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 another, it's another job. I mean, so I was really, really fascinated. Um, we still have some, some, um, some room for questions if uh, people from the audience uh, have them, uh, just fire them in the, in the chat. Uh, uh, or um, while we are waiting for, I can ask you a, a personal curiosity. Um, ask it. Okay, so um, it's it's again about uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, this kind of businesses where complexity and uh, the, the spread of technologies is very very broad. So what's uh, what's your um, it, it, the question comes from when you started presenting uh, the Arbor operator and you cited a uh, quite different uh, um, repository management systems and uh, all of them were open sources and they, they have um, some backing um, founding companies. Uh, so in this kind of scenario, uh, what, which is the trade-off? Where is the criteria in the uh, maybe to select something uh, open source? Uh, and so with the, all the, the prop that is carrying the cons, uh, instead of uh, something that you can buy from a vendor, to close the source or whatever, where you, you pay a license. Yeah, uh, in this case, the product we wanted to do wasn't available from a vendor in an in a end form because we wanted a private registry, but to be able to spawn it a big scale for our customers and for each customer to have their own private registry. So they were open projects, but all of them were oriented to have one private registry for you, for the company. So we wanted to use one of these products uh, in order to put it at the big scale. And we were aware that we were, we were going to need to code. The idea was using hardware, it was a mature project. We wanted to, do, to code the missing part in order to be able to do a managed hardware. And then the problem, it, did, it didn't exist. Uh, we could have coded it for ourselves, directly for our needs. But the choice going off open source and doing it with the community was both a choice of values and a choice of pragmatism. I mean, we believe in open source. Uh, we don't like model when you use open source, you take profit from open source and you don't give back. So for us, from company culture for the company philosophy, if you use open source, you try to contribute. But also, there is a very pragmatic 
down to earth reason. Uh, if we did it only for ourselves, we were going to have to learn it by ourselves. So we were going to have to commit resources, people, in order to code and maintain it for forever. If we do it with the community, it's nice for the community, but it is also nice for us because the community will help us to maintain, to make this code better, and to help us to continue to work with this code. So in this case, the choice of going open source was a choice of love and reason, you can say. Of course, yeah, yeah, and and uh, if I can add uh, uh, a thought, it's uh, that uh, it also helps to standardize the world of tools at some point, so we don't have to learn. Uh, uh, so contributing in the direction of kind of standard. Think about HTML, for example, when it uh, was proposed yeah. as a standard. And, it, and then uh, we convert, uh, discarding some stuff that was still open source, but uh, uh, the, the, the word for the developer with less uh, confusion, less tools, yes, standards uh, is way better. <laughs> uh, I really agree. And we, as a company, we left at that several years ago. Several years ago, uh, when we had a project like that, we got it from the beginning to the end by ourselves. And the problem was that the de facto standard was the open source project product. So we had to have people experience it in our product, but most of the market used another one. So working with open source, working with the community is also good for that. You are working with the technology, with the product that the community is using. It is easier to find people with the right skills and the skills that we work on that will be useful for other projects, yeah. Especially where this this, uh, this argument is it's really, really valid in a world where uh, uh, also the people is very rare to find on the market. Uh, if you look for software yeah. engineers on the market, uh, it's, it's incredibly hard to find good people. <laughs> a few compliments uh, for your presentation from this anonymous. And uh, he say, or she say also, could I ask if is there, if uh, there are some parts of the operator development uh, uh, for which the knowledge of the Go language is mandatory? So it's about, uh, do I need to, to know Golang to code? Uh, well, uh, today there are two ways to do full, complete operators. You can either do it in Go, lang Go language or you can use Ansible. If you are more of a developer, the only real way is Golang, uh, Go. And if you are more of a sysadmin, SRE, you can use Ansible because it's a tool that you are already used. The third way to write operators it was is helm. using Helm, but it isn't complete. You can only okay. do very simple operators. Okay, so if you would like a real language, go for Golang. So, yeah, or okay. if you are a sysadmin, go for Ansible. Ansible. Yeah. Okay, perfectly clear. So that's uh, the real closing, I guess. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't, uh, we weren't able to have a, a more. I am, I am really <laughs> sorry for the connection button. problem. And I am really, really happy to, to be able to be there for the question. And I hope maybe next year we will do it in, in live, in physically, <laughs> in person. <laughs> Okay, so see you in person, hopefully, and uh, enjoy your weekend and the rest uh, of Thank your you work there. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Grazie. Ciao.